Hey folks, how's it going? Brothers and sisters, <laughs> freedom from grace. Freedom from grace, that's quite something here. I got a few notes here. You notice the big boy here is gone. It was out running today, pulling 83 hopper cars. It's out on the Rays Railroad now, parked inside. And if you ever want to watch some, if you're some of you train people, if you're interested in model trains, garden trains, if you look up, <clears throat> see my railroad's name is North Table Creek Garden Railroad, which is N T C G R R. And if you punch that in YouTube, then it'll come up, or Marty Cozette or something like that. Sometimes that comes up and stuff. And uh, but the big boy got taken out today, so my son was here, and he. Uh, was, this is Sunday afternoon and stuff. It's pretty hot out. And we ran a couple dash nights and we videotaped them and stuff. And I got to get a better video camera. This one's got a scratch in it too there. So one of the things that uh, I find about being an anti-Paul person is you can run the cult people off really fast. The Mormons might stop me and talk to me. And I got a couple of them that girls, they run in pairs and stuff. They're missionaries here in our Nebraska city in our town. And they do their stuff and they start trying to talk to me, but I'll tell you what, they've been trained to be able to fight against the church, but to, to talk to an anti prawl person, they're clueless. They look at you like, what are you talking about? You start quoting verses to them and telling them stuff, they have no idea where to go with this. And they don't call you back, they don't give you tracts, and they don't come back. The Jehovah Witnesses and some of them too, you know, a friend of mine, he stopped arguing, stopped fighting with me and stuff. And so, a friend of mine called today, and uh, where he lives, he decided he'd try a different church. And he said he thought of me the whole time because uh, the pastor, every single verse that the pastor read from was about Paul, Pauline doctrine, teaching Paul. Someone else had a missionary on here. They sent me a video, and I started watching it. It talked about division between the old and new. And everything he talked about with the old and new was from Paul, how Paul explained the need or the, the veil that's covered the Old Testament and how the, it's just it's so sad, it's just prevalent, it's everywhere. Uh, this is uh, Douglas D. Tonto, Tonto, hopefully, sir, I'm saying it right. I have a high respect for this guy. His videos are outstanding. And uh, it's, it's one of those things where to me, he's almost, he's way over my head. Uh, he gives details, uh, like this verse he talks about, Mark 7, 15. He had a 25-minute video on that one verse. And uh, the history, how Martin Luther, how... Uh, it was just an incredible video, but I don't think a lot of my friends would really take the time to watch it and study it and learn from it. So what I did is, because it involved me, and it talks about unclean foods, I decided I'm going to go ahead and... I already had done some studying on clean and unclean foods, so I just made a shorter video that I think uh, the average person would want to listen to and uh, look up the verses. So the last church I was at, the pastor said that Jesus stated in Mark 7, 15, and most of the translations say, and sometimes it's in italics, sometimes it's in parentheses, that Jesus said that all foods are clean. And so people take that one verse and they build a whole doctrine on it and they eliminate the rest of the Bible. And so let's see, did Jesus really say all foods are clean or did the translators do this? That's a question, but if you're not willing to question the word of God, then you're not going to find this stuff out. Mark 7.15, there is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that came out of a person are what defile him. And what I learned from this gentleman, this Mr. Douglas, was defile in the Greek means to make common. So if you reread the verse with the proper Greek meaning, and I do that a lot of times. When I find out what the meaning is, I reread the verse with the correct meaning and the correct word, and then it makes more sense. And so if you put the whole context of verse 16 and 17 in there, you're going to see that he's talking about what's common in the world, you know, and so forth. So, But uh, to me, the biggest argument, this, this is why I'm sharing this, okay? This is the key point right here, is if Jesus really did, if Yeshua said that all foods are clean, 
that he is an apostate. He is speaking against the Father's laws. He's against speaking against the Father's rules. See, you have to think about this. Every time people say that Jesus said something contrary to the Father, does that make him a false prophet? Based on the Deuteronomy 13 test. Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 3. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass, and if he says, let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words. This is just like when Jesus says, my words, my life, my, 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 my. He talks about following him. Paul talks about following him. You're going to see, I'm seeing more and more the importance of God's words and not signs and wonders. I lost my place there. You should not listen to the words of that prophet or the dream of dreamers. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And I've shared that now recently with a couple different young couples that I've been talking with and stuff. And uh, how else can the Father test us if we truly love His words and His ways? Can somebody who is giving us signs and wonders, sounding good, and drawing our affections, our affections, do we love that preacher and pastor? I know people who are only going to church and they will testify that they're there to support the pastor. They're not there. They will not say, I'm there because God calls me there. Or God, you know, stuff like that. Key, <clears throat> Matthew 5, 17 and 18. Do not think that I came to abolish the laws or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth passes away, not an iota or a dot will pass from the law until all this is accomplished. My dear aunt, which I would love to have her watch these videos, still says she sticks on the one word that Jesus fulfilled it for her. That's imputed righteousness garbage from Paul. She's a Pentecostal Holy Ghost speaking in tongues multiple language thing. I believe she's her whole salvation now is, has been based on her signs and wonders under the Pentecostal movement. And am I talking bad about the Holy Spirit? Am I or what? But she denies that we have to do any of the commandments. Everything she says that the Sabbath doesn't matter. She goes to church on Sunday. That's her Sabbath. It's made for man. See, they take all these one or two verses and they use it to justify rather than saying, hey, let me see really what the Father is saying. And I verify this. I say, people doubt me. They say, hey, Marty, you're nuts. Jesus fulfilled it for us. I said, then in Mark 7, 8, why did Jesus say, you leave the commandments of God and hold to the traditions of men? Why does Jesus say in Mark 13, thus making void the word of God by your traditions that you have handed down and many such things you do? How do you know what Jesus meant by fulfill to do fully? One verse does not constitute a doctrine. And that's one of the biggest problems. We get our security uh, and our beliefs all set up on one or two verses that we've been programmed or trained. John 15 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I keep, have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. 1 John 2, 4, John the Beloved backs this up. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. I can share all these things. But my aunt goes back to, he said he fulfilled them. Don't you believe Jesus' words? He fulfilled them? How come I can't accept that? Because I got all these other verses saying that I'm misunderstanding what fulfill means. Fulfill does not dominate all these other verses. Deuteronomy 7, 9. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God and faithful, the faithful God 
who keeps covenants and steadfast love with those who keep, who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. To a thousand generations. How do I don't know if I have a little Jewish blood in me? Maybe I'm from one of the tribes of Israel way back. How do we know? Oh, it's just for Israelites or just for the Jews. No. Do you know for a fact that your lineage has nothing to do with, do with one of the, the tribes? See, those are things that we need to think about, guys. It's just, uh, it's just incredible. Uh, let me throw this one in here. This is free. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8, 7 and 8, <clears throat> whatever, however, not all possess this knowledge. See, I question Paul on everything he does, so that's just, okay, what do you mean by that, Paul? you got to go back to 1 Corinthians 8, 4. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but the one true God. See, he tries to set some of this stuff up as superior knowledge to what the Father has already said. Let's go back to that 7 and 8. But some through former association with idols eat food as really as really offered to idol to an idol and their conscience being weak is defiled make common same word food will not condemn commend us to God we are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do eat he completely rationalizes it in a human form and disregards what the Father has already commanded and said. Revelation 2.20 But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. That's what Yeshua said in, to John in Romans through the angel. Ezekiel 22-26 and I see this in the church today everywhere. Her priests have done violence to my law and have profaned my holy things, set apart things. They have made no distinction between the holy and the common. There's a guy that I just started watching. He's been rebuttaling me back and forth and I suggested to him some of the verses in James about watching your tongue and how your tongue can be a flame of fire and how we got to guard our mouths and guard what we say and different things like that. He's sitting there smoking and cussing while he's preaching about anti-Paul and uh, sharing his stuff. And I'm going, he says, I'm, I'm a Pauline person. No place says, he, oh, he told me that uh, the father mentions the word dungs, dung, dung so many times in the, in the Bible and stuff. And it's like his whole thing is just Pauline doctrine. He wants to justify his sin because there's not a direct commandment that says, thou shalt not burn leaves in thy mouth. And so, anyway, I, I tried to show, oh yeah, and he threw the log in my eye thing. And I said, that's funny, sir, because I have gotten a log out of my eye. I do not smoke. And therefore, I am able to help you remove the little speck that's in your eye. It's not healthy for you. He completely disregarded that statement. Where are we at? Common. Neither have, neither have taught the difference between the unclean and the clean. They have disregarded my Sabbath so that I am profaned among them. People talk bad about God. They have a complete warped sense of character who he is. That's the whole thing. They're distorting who he is and making him sound like a Santa Claus, this whole grace thing. And so, I'll tell you, it's, it's been exciting, folks. I mean, you can probably tell I'm not getting as depressed anymore. I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm finding more and more people. Uh, Father uh, Yahweh is, is raising up more and more people. Uh, I, someone mentioned that maybe this might be the, the next uh, Reformation coming. You know, not so much a revival, but a Reformation. And uh, I just, if you got books that you recommend for me to read, I'd like to do that. I do like to buy books. I'm probably about, I want to sell some of the books I got because I got so much money in them. But on the other hand, they're all, a lot of them are trash since they're all Pauline based books. But uh, I want to find out about Luther's, uh, where he came from, and the guy, the professor, I can't think of his name, 
that helped uh, uh, Luther get more and more on the straight and narrow, and, and he wanted to put Paul's words way less than Jesus and stuff. But, but uh, Luther wanted to stick to infant baptism, a bunch of other stuff, and so forth. So, Father Yahweh, I'm so grateful for you. I thank you so much for your precious word. Uh, all the translations, all the different little problems, uh, all they are is the rocks and stones on the narrow path that we're, we're not stumbling over, but we're learning to walk over and learning to keep our balance and keep our heads on straight and keep our hearts on our first love. Uh, Father, help us uh, with your Holy Spirit. Guide us and direct us. And thank you so much that we do not rely on our emotions and on our uh, signs and wonders and little oohs and ahs, but that your word became flesh and dwelt among us. And your word is what's going to carry us through. In your son's precious name, amen.